It's the biggest battle of the three-year war. Saudi Emirati warplanes pound areas south of Yemen's main port, Hodeida. As troops close in, Houthi rebels remain defiant. The UN is urging restraint, fearing a humanitarian catastrophe. But is there any hope of a diplomatic solution? This is Inside Story. Welcome to the program. I'm Elizabeth Peranum. The push to seize the port of Hodeida is well and truly underway. The Saudi Emirati coalition is intensifying its offensive and pro-government Yemeni troops are edging closer to the city, a stronghold of Houthi rebels. There have been casualties on both sides in heavy fighting. In Hodeida itself, the population is bracing for the worst. Laura Bird and Manley has more. Yemen's port city of Hodeida was bustling with people buying food on Thursday. But this is also a city bracing for a heavy bombardment. People here are barely living. There is unemployment in Hodeida. There are no jobs. A person here works to earn his daily living. There will be a big crisis if the fighting moved into the city. With poverty and hunger and the war, the residents will be victims. People are dying from hunger. The country will be destroyed. The coalition has captured a town south of Hodeida as fierce fighting and airstrikes pound the area. The UN Security Council has held two closed-door meetings this week, both concluding that the only solution to the crisis is a political and not military one. The UAE ambassador says there are ships on standby to supply Hodeida once the military operation ends. Even our ships are just uh, in the Red Sea waiting. So uh, our, we, we have air, air freight, we have uh, very, well, very well organized, and we are ready to, to send uh, all, every assistance for, uh, for Hadeida. The council will meet for further discussions on Monday, but many analysts agree that a battle for Hadeida will not draw Yemen's three-year war closer to an end. Supposing that there will be a successful sort of military takeover of Hadeida, um, uh, many questions remain. What will happen to other parts of the country? Uh, you know, what will happen to um, uh, who will run Hadeida? What will happen to you know the deep divides among among Yemenis? I think that uh, you know the, it, it's important to recognize the Houthis um, as as a political actor, as they were back in 2013-14. As the Saudi-led coalition foresees a military victory over the strategic port, the formerly exiled president, Abd Rabul Mansour Hadi, has arrived in the southern city of Aden for the first time since February 2017 to oversee the operations. But the UN warns the attack on Hodeida could kill up to a quarter of a million people and shut down the main route for food and humanitarian aid to the rest of the country. This would have a devastating impact on the survival of a population already teetering on the brink of famine. Laura Burden Manley, Al Jazeera. Well, Hodeida lies on Yemen's Red Sea coast. 70% of the country's food supplies enter through the port, which has been under the control of Houthi rebels since 2015. The coalition believes its assault on the port is necessary if it's to have an opportunity of retaking the capital, Sana'a. The risk is it will exacerbate what the UN already considers the world's worst humanitarian crisis. Elise Grande is the United Nations Humanitarian Coordinator for Yemen, and she's joining us on Skype from the capital, Sana'a. Uh, thank you very much for your time, Ms. Grande. How concerning is this offensive, given Hudaydah's importance to the country? 90% of all of the basic commodities that people in northern Yemen depend upon come through the single port of Hudaydah. If there's any cut up the, that port, even for a limited period of time, the impact will be immediate and it will be very, very steep. This is one of the reasons that we are so concerned about the military assault yeah. on the port in the city. We're also deeply concerned because there are 600,000 innocent civilians inside of Hudaydah right now. Last year, in the world's largest cholera outbreak, one of the epicenters was Hudaydah. And many of the people who are suffering the most in the country are in that city. 
This is another reason that we are so concerned about the humanitarian impact of the assault. Ms. Grande, the Saudis are saying that they're planning on retaking the airport, the seaport, and the route from Hodeida to the capital, Sana'a, but that they have no plans to engage in urban warfare. But are you as certain that this fighting is not going to reach the city of 600,000 people? If fighting were to be in the centre of the city, I think we would have to face the fact that the impact would be very serious. It could, in fact, be catastrophic. Hudaydah is very densely populated, and if there is a ground conflict, then we know that civilians will be at very grave risk. We would probably have to assume that there could be a large number of casualties. The most important point for all of the parties to the conflict, you know, in, under international humanitarian law, parties to the conflict are obliged to do absolutely everything possible to ensure that civilians survive. They are the ones who are responsible for ensuring that people live. But unfortunately, none of the parties in this conflict seem to be doing that. We have the Emiratis who are saying that they're carrying out this operation because the Arab coalition could actually better manage the port and the flow of aid. What do you make of that? You know, how have the Houthis done at managing the port? And have there been any issues with the flow of aid during their control? The port of Hudaydah is the lifeline for Yemen. Any cutoff of that port, as we said earlier, is going to have dramatic impact. For the past several years, as the war has waged, the United Nations and all of the humanitarian partners have called on all of the parties to the conflict to keep that port open. Nothing is more important than that. Right now, 70% of all of the humanitarian assistance that the United Nations and frontline partners are bringing into the country yeah. comes through Hudaydah. And this is why we're saying it's got to stay open. Would you rather the Houthis stayed in control of the port if it meant that there was no fighting? From a humanitarian point of view, what matters is that the port is open. It doesn't matter who manages the port. It matters that the port is open and that humanitarians are able to bring in the assistance. Humanitarians are neutral in the context of a war. What matters is that parties to the conflict do everything that they are obliged to do to protect civilians and assure the civilians have the assistance that they need. That's what counts. And Ms. Grande, you've spoken about the impact that um, any damage to the port could have on civilians in Yemen. Tell us more about this impact. You know, what does it really mean? What does it look like? Three quarters of all of the people who live in Yemen are dependent on some form of humanitarian assistance and protection in order to survive. There is no other country in the world right now where a larger percentage of the population is dependent on aid. Out of the 22 million Yemenis who need help, 18 million are food insecure. They rely on food that comes in through ports like Hudeda and also through ports like Aden. This is why we are so concerned about the military assault on Hudaydah. If something happens to that port, if we're not able to bring in food, either humanitarian supplies or commercial imports, we know that literally millions of people in Yemen will be in a very desperate situation. And this is why the UN met about this. I think they had a meeting for about two hours. But did they actually take any action to ensure um, the safety of civilians in Hudaydah and to ensure that aid and food supplies keep flowing. So the United Nations Security Council yesterday had a closed door session to discuss exactly this issue. The Security Council called on all of the parties to the conflict to do everything possible to ensure that they protect civilians and they make sure that civilians have access to the food and the medicines, the water, all the things they need in order to survive. You know, humanitarian law is a collective responsibility. All of the member states of the United Nations, all the country in the world are responsible for upholding it. So when the Security Council calls on the parties of the conflict to do what they are obliged to do, what they are underlining is the collective responsibility yeah. to ensure that innocent civilians survive. But again, given that the warring parties are not listening to these calls and have not so far for the better part of the three-year war, is that enough? You know, a number of steps have been taken during the war to protect civilians. We have, for example, a deconfliction mechanism in place. 
It includes a no strike list of more than 20,000 locations. These are hospital and schools and very important public infrastructure that civilians depend on in order to survive. All the parties have agreed not to strike these particular locations. We also have agreements in place with all of the parties to the conflict. When we deliver food, for example, we say to all of the parties, we're delivering this food, don't strike these areas. These mechanisms have been in place for the last several years. They are largely successful. We have also asked the parties to the conflict in the case of Fudeda to do the same thing, to honor these deconfliction requests. This is an important mechanism, and it's one of the ways that humanitarian partners are working with the parties to the conflict in the midst of the fighting to ensure that civilians survive. All right, Ms. Grande, thank you very much for your time on this. That is the UN's humanitarian coordinator for Yemen, Lisa Grande, joining us live from Sana'a. Thank you. Well, we are now joined from Gothenburg, also via Skype, after Nasser, freelance journalist and Yemeni blogger, and from Sana'a, pro-Houthi journalist Hussein al Bukhathi. A very warm welcome to both of you. Uh, Mr. Bukhathi, let me start with you. The Houthis have withstood three years of, uh, this, of attacks from the Saudi-led coalition, but can they withstand this offensive? Um, I, I believe they will do uh, all it takes uh, to protect uh, Hudaydah port. Uh, and it doesn't mean that if, uh, if they have been defeated uh, or withdrawn from uh, other area like in Aden, that they will give up uh, this uh, uh, second largest uh, city in Yemen uh, so easy. Uh, and uh, well, I mean, what I see is really, really strange that uh, all the blame uh, is actually put uh, on the Houthi. Uh, as I heard, the, uh, I believe the humanitarian coordinator from Sana'a, uh, she said what matters now is that the, the port stays open. This means that the port actually uh, does, uh, is kind of open and it brings uh, some humanitarian aid uh, to Yemen. Uh, as some NGOs say, 80% of the aid uh, come through the port. So the Houthi existent or present in Hodeida port uh, does not obstruct uh, any of, uh, of the flow of the humanitarian aid uh, into Yemen. And the side that should be actually asked and called to stop it's offen offensive, yeah. is the Saudi-led coalition who has actually now is trying to invade the port. Uh, Ms. Nasser, the Emiratis are saying that the operation is a critical step towards achieving a political solution to the conflict. But does it bring this conflict any closer to a political solution, do you think? Does it change, um, you know, the calculus of the overall war? Not at all. I think uh, the battle for Hdaida is just uh, another uh, attempt by the Saudi-led coalition to bring the Houthis into the negotiation table, but not really to find a political solution. They're, tr they're trying to put uh, the whole nation on its knees, actually, uh, not only the, the Houthis, uh, because um, it, for anyone to have control over a humanitarian um, uh, aid uh, channel uh, is going to have, uh, you know, the ultimate power mm -hmm. to who's feeding the people. And the Saudi-led coalition uh, has a long history uh, in the course of Yemen war, where are many reports really showing in evidence how they are using uh, food as a weapon of war. So, no, I mean, even if the Houthis are the ones uh, uh, remaining the, the port open today, we're still undergoing the world's largest humanitarian yep. catastrophe. So absolutely, they're not doing their job uh, right. And if the, the Saudi-led coalition is going to have the, the upper hand on the port as well, we're going to see another phase or layer of the humanitarian, uh, the world's largest humanitarian uh, catastrophe in Yemen. Mr. Bukaiti, if the Houthis do lose control of this port, and they might because this is the largest offensive yet in this three-year war, what will it, that mean for their position in the war? How much will it weaken them? Um, I mean, I, I don't think that uh, it will uh, weaken uh, the Houthi. It could just uh, damage uh, 
uh, the Houthi just reputation that they couldn't maybe defend uh, the port. Uh, but the Houthi, I mean, are are really strong uh, in Hodeida at this point and in, in any uh, other area. And the Saudi-led coalition has been waging a war uh, on Yemen and on Ansar al uh, for for uh, th three uh, years and I, I believe uh, three months. And they haven't actually succeeded in the goals that they have uh, put at the beginning, uh, as they say, to destroy uh, the Houthi military uh, capacity and to, to, to destroy a Yemeni uh, ballistic missile uh, uh, that's in the hand of the Houthi. Before the war, there was no attacks on the Saudi, but now the Houthi are launching more missiles uh, on the Saudi. Uh, and we see that the Yemeni government actually doesn't dare to go uh, to Aden, uh, or as they, as they call it, uh, the, the, the legitimacy. So we don't know what was the point. Uh, behind uh, this war, but what was really good that we we hear all NGOs and UN Security, Security Council and the UN they all agree on the importance of this uh, lifeline. Yeah. Uh, but on the other hand, they kind of agree that the, the problem is uh, is from the Houthi. And I will just mention that uh, Sweden in the UN Security Council has called on all parties to halt all operation. Yeah. They said so to give time to to the Houthi. To, uh, to withdraw from, from the, this, this port. And the problem is not the Houthi. The, the port was destroyed by the Saudi-led coalition. Uh, it, it, uh, they have targeted the main cranes in the port. And that's why the port can not only receive small ships uh, into Yemen, but I can just, uh, I'm sure that the, the Houthi are really well dug in uh, in Hudaida and they will fight for Hudaida till the death. And the one who should bear the responsibility is the one who started this war against Yemen and as well this latest offensive against Hudaida. Ms. Nasser, let me bring you in. You know, it is because of the sort of vital importance of this port that we are now seeing um, the U.S. reject a request from the Emirati government this week to provide intelligence, reconnaissance aircraft, naval minesweepers because of congressional opposition to that offensive. Do you think that's significant, given how much um, the U.S. has supported the Saudi-led coalition so far? Uh, I think there is a conflicting uh, stance from the American side. So you have at the Congress level, there is a rejection or a refusal to support the Saudi-led coalition offensive against uh, Hudaydah. But at the same time, you have Trump and his administration uh, kind of giving a full support to the Saudi, uh, the Saudis and the Emiratis. So you have a sort of like uh, uh, conflicting stance. And in my opinion, that's very hopeful. Mm -hmm. At least there is a, uh, an aspect of humanitarian concerns towards what's happening in Yemen. But now the question, I think, is what's going to happen next? If the, uh, the Saudi-led coalition going to have uh, to win at the the port uh, at any uh, you know cost, yeah. uh, whether there is a, hu a human cost or not. Uh, in my opinion, the alarming uh, uh, consequences will be uh, uh, if if the battle of Hodeida will open other fronts for other battles, and in mind comes a battle for Sanaa. I think the timing for the Houthi uh, for uh, Hodeida battle comes with uh, uh, Tariq Saleh leading uh, this military vision mm -hmm. from Marib with the help of the Saudis and the Emiratis. So it's very alarming what is going to happen next. Next, what which battle is going to be next? Yeah. Because absolutely, this is just to push uh, the Houthis to the uh, north of Yemen and not really to find yeah. a political solution. Well, I do want to talk more about this battle that we're seeing now, and also more about the international actors involved. Because even if it is, you know, somewhat hopeful that the U.S. rejected the Emiratis' requests for extra supplies at this time, the French actually came in and agreed, according to the Emiratis, to provide them with minesweepers to clear explosives that, you know, the Houthis had placed in the harbour. Mr. Bukethi, you know, various countries are saying that they don't want this offensive, that they don't want the Saudis and Emiratis to fight for control of the port. But if they are at the same time also arming this coalition, and you know you have the United States, Britain, France, all doing so, does the UN, you know, is the UN working so hard on a political solution achieve anything when these powers continue to arm the fighters on the ground? 
Um, I don't think the United uh, Nations has been working really well to uh, to reach uh, a solution. Uh, and uh, me personally, uh, I believe that the United Nations has been uh, biased uh, in this uh, uh, conflict uh, because one of the first things that uh, they haven't mentioned the Saudi-led uh, coalition uh, name uh, in any of the statement as a part of this war. They always say it's a civil war and they, they try to bring Yemeni parties together. If they mention the Saudi as one part and Houthi as one one part and as well had the government as one part to bring them all to the table, then we can hold Saudi led coalition responsible for any uh, break of any ceasefire or any agreement uh, in, in, in the future. And I will just mention about uh, that the United Arab Emirates has asked, uh, asked uh, United States uh, for support in this uh, operation. I think those just uh, lies because uh, they do it in the media to cover up the real involv involvement of the United States. And I'd like to say that the United States is not involved. The war was de declared on 26th of March 2015 for from the United States by the Saudi ambassador. And this is the first war, I think, that has been declared from uh, another uh, another country. And I believe that uh, Ansar al Houthi and many Yemeni don't trust the United Nations uh, or to give up yeah. Hodeida port uh, to be under the control of the, of the United Nations just for, for, I will give you just some example. Uh, I mean, we've seen that the United Nations in Srebrenica, in, uh, in, uh, in Bosnia, in, in Sabra and Shatila, in Lebanon, what they have done, uh, they have taken the weapons from the people there who were fighting uh, against the aggression. But at the end, uh, the, uh, the Serbian has killed 8,000 in Sabra and Shatila. The United Nations All right, has so I understand your Israeli point has killed six, that uh, 5, the Houthis do not so trust no the trust United, United Nations. Nations. I understand. But what about Iran and its role? Is it doing everything it can to encourage a political solution to this conflict? Uh, I don't know why they always try to bring uh, Iran uh, in the conflict. Uh, they blame Iran for uh, uh, sending weapons into Yemen. We have this blockade. It's hard to bring medicine into Yemen. How can Iran uh, bring those uh, long-range missiles, as they say, uh, in, uh, into Yemen? And this is just an excuse uh, to fight Iran, the same they have done it in, in other countries. And on, on the top of that, we see that the United Arab Emirates claim that uh, Iran is occupying three islands in, 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 in the Persian Gulf. Why they have actually fought Iran there. Just, this is just, as I say, it's just an excuse to say that Iran is involved. I mean, right. about the weapons that they say. Uh, the United uh, States is bringing all these weapons to the Saudi. Why they kind of try to tell someone else if it's true, why are you bringing the weapons to the other side? They should all stop or, I mean, just we will see what's going to happen in the battlefield. All right, Mr. Bukhati. Uh, Ms. Nasser, President Abd Rabul Mansour Hadi is back from exile. Why is he back in the country? He's been away for over a year now. Why now? I think your question is a telling question. Um, uh, only in Yemen, when a president is coming back to his country, it becomes like a breaking news. And that's unfortunately, you know, a manifestation of the failure of uh, Abdurrabbo Mansour Hadi administration in Yemen. Uh, technically, there is uh, uh, no administration and the cabinet is uh, running the country uh, by remote control from Riyadh or Egypt or other uh, Arab countries. So it's very, very frustrating that you see uh, a president uh, uh, mm. not uh, existing in uh, his country. But fortunately, uh, people are also very happy that he's finally back. And I think this all moves are calculated. Uh, um, his uh, coming back uh, uh, yesterday, it's uh, the first day of Eid uh, also in, uh, in Yemen and m many other Arab mm -hmm. uh, Muslim countries. Uh, so he wants to have a certain uh, you know, message to the people that is there, um, especially you know, in parallel right. to uh, the Hudaydah uh, battle. And also not to, m not to forget that um, uh, yesterday there was uh, a speech uh, uh, leaked by uh, or published uh, for Ali Abdullah Saleh uh, uh, days or one day before he was killed. Uh, and I think that is also another calculated uh, uh, steps uh, uh, from, uh, from uh, you know, trying to influence the uh, Yemeni All right, public. Ms. So we, have, uh, we don't have very long left in the program and I would like to ask uh, Mr. Bukhati one last question. You have 30 seconds. What is it going to take to ensure that this offensive is not going to cost this country even more suffering? Um, if the United Nations and the UN Security Council will not have pressure on that side that has caused this disaster in Yemen, 
which is Saudi Arabia led coalition. Uh, then, of course, if the war has been uh, brought into Hudaydah, we will see the last lifeline will be cut and millions of Yemeni will be affected. Uh, the, the humanitarian aid and humanitarian lifeline should, should not be used as a weapons to ask one side to withdraw from an area. If you accept this time to withdraw from Hudaydah, they will say withdraw from right. Sana'a, withdraw from other area. And one final thing, just mention the Saudi as a part of this war and bring them to talk directly with the Houthi under the UN right, and we will Bukhaisi. reach a solution soon. Thank you very much. That is Hussein al Bukhaisi in Sana'a and Afra Nasser joining us from Gothenburg. Thank you both very much for your time. And thank you too for watching. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, do go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. A handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Elizabeth Piranum, and the whole team here. Bye for now.